StatQuest, StatQuest, StatQuest. Hello, and welcome to StatQuest. StatQuest is brought to you by the friendly folks in the genetics department at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Today, we're going to be talking about heat maps. I know you've seen them many times before, so let's just get started. Here's a heat map that I drew for a friend of mine not too long ago. The rows are genes, and the columns are RNA-seq samples. The data displayed in this heat map has been modified in two ways so that we can gain some insights from it. The first way is that the relative abundances have been scaled. In this case, this was done on a per-gene basis. Other heat maps you've seen out there scale all the genes at once. Anyways, this makes it easy to see that sample X has more or less of gene Y than sample Z. For example, the scaling makes it easy to see that sample 1 expresses this gene highlighted in the black box more than the others. However, this specific gene-by-gene -gene scaling means that we can't compare across genes. The dark red bar in sample 1 for this gene doesn't mean that sample 1 transcribes it more than other genes, just other samples. The other modification that was done to this data is that the rows, that is to say the genes, have been grouped according to similarity. This grouping, or clustering, makes it easy to see genes that are transcribed most in the second sample and least in the fourth sample. These genes are transcribed most in the first sample and also least in the fourth sample. And lastly, these genes are transcribed most in the second sample and least in the third sample. The clustering isn't by chance, but due to a computer program that tries to put similar things close together. We'll talk about this in more detail later on. Without clustering, the data would look like this, a mishmash that's harder to interpret. Without clustering or scaling, the data would look like this, which is completely uninterpretable. Notice that one gene is highly transcribed compared to the others. It's an outlier. Okay, now that we've seen one heat map, let's look at another, slightly more complicated heat map. Like the heat map before, this heat map has been scaled and clustered. However, the scaling is global, not per row or gene, but for all rows and genes. We can use global scaling because we don't have an outlier like we did in the last data set. The clustering in this heat map is done for both the columns and the rows, not just the rows like we did last time. That is to say, both the samples and the genes are clustered. For example, we can see that these columns or samples that we've highlighted in the black box cluster together, indicating that the transcription patterns in these samples are similar. We also see that these rows or genes cluster together. This indicates genes that have similar transcription patterns across samples. Without the clustering, we have a total mismatch, and it's hard to see what's what. Without clustering or scaling, we have a total disaster. Before we move on to the details of scaling and clustering, here's a quick aside. What if we had used global scaling with the first heat map? When we do this, we see that the outlier skews the scale so much that it's impossible to see the other genes. Also, notice that the clustering changes and the genes have a new order. Scaling can affect two things, how brightly colored the genes are and whether you can compare between them, and the clustering. And now, back to the action. Now we're going to talk about how to scale the data. Regardless of whether you do it by gene or globally, the most common method is nameless. I hate to coin a new term, but let's call it z-score scaling, because technically it converts the data to z-scores. Here's how to do it. Let's talk about converting to z-scores, or z-score scaling. In this example, we have RNA-seq read counts from six samples. The first step is to calculate the mean of the data. In this case, that's 16.5. The second step is to subtract the mean from each value. By subtracting the mean from each value, we center the data around zero. 
Samples with relatively high transcription get positive values, and samples with relatively low transcription get negative values. The third step is to calculate the standard deviation. In this case, it's 6.28. The fourth step is to divide each data point by the standard deviation. Notice that the scale on the axis has changed. The data used to be spread from minus 8 to plus 8. Now it's between minus 1.2 and 1.2. For you math nuts out there, here's the formula for z-score scaling. In the numerator, we have the mean subtracted from each sample value. This is then divided by the standard deviation. Over on the right, we've got the fancy Greek notation for this. Regardless of the variation in the original data, dividing by the standard deviation ensures that it's tightly grouped. And you might ask yourself, why do we need to ensure the data is tightly grouped? We do this because we can only discern so many shades of colors. The wider the range, the more subtle the differences in the shades. By tightly grouping the data, we use fewer shades and it's easier to see sample 1 has more transcription than sample 2. Another brief aside, what if there is an outlier? In this example, sample A is our outlier. Everything else is relatively tightly clustered. In this case, the standard deviation is going to be much larger than what we had before. That is to say, the denominator will be much larger. And the values near zero will get compressed a lot, and it will be hard to separate them with only a few shades. This will make it a lot harder to see what's going on. When we did global scaling on the data set with the outlier, we saw what happens. One gene is clearly highly expressed, but we can't see any differences in the other genes. Okay, now that we understand scaling, let's move on to clustering. This is the fun part. There are two main types of clustering, hierarchical and k-means. We'll focus on hierarchical clustering for now. Here's an example of how hierarchical clustering works. We're going to start with a simple example that has three samples and four genes. For this example, we are just going to use clustering to reorder the rows, or the genes. Conceptually, here's what we do. First, we figure out which gene is most similar to gene 1. So we look and we see that genes 1 and 2 are different. Genes 1 and 3 are similar, and genes 1 and 4 are also similar. However, gene 1 is most similar to gene 3. The second step is to figure out which gene is most similar to gene number 2, and then we'll figure out which gene is most similar to 3, and then which gene is most similar to 4. In this example, gene 2 is most similar to gene 4. Also note, there's a little typo in the text where I have the plural genes when I meant the singular gene. This is embarrassing, but we're just going to go with it. Here's the third conceptual step. Of the different combinations, figure out which two genes are the most similar. Merge them into a cluster. In this example, genes 1 and 3 are more similar than any other combination. So genes 1 and 3 are now cluster number 1. Now the last step in our conceptual list of things to do is step four. We go back to step one, but now we treat the new cluster, that's cluster number one, like it's a single gene. That is to say, we compare cluster one to find out which gene it's most similar to. In this case, it's most similar to gene number four. Gene two is most similar to gene number four. And genes 2 and 4 are the most similar combination. Lastly, we merge genes 2 and 4 into a cluster, and we're all done. Hierarchical clustering is usually accompanied by what's called a dendrogram. It indicates both the similarity and the order that the clusters were formed. Cluster number 1 was formed first, and the genes within it are most similar to each other. Cluster number 2 was formed second, and the genes within it are the second most similar. Cluster number three, which contains all of the genes and merges the two clusters, 
was formed last. Now that we have a conceptual idea of what's going on, let's get down to the nitpicky details. In the first step, we have to figure out which gene is most similar to gene 1. However, before we do that, we have to define what most similar means. Unfortunately, the method for determining similarity is arbitrarily chosen. However, there are some common practices. The first and most common one is the Euclidean distance between genes. Here's the formula for that. It's the square root of the square of the difference in sample 1 between gene 1 and gene 2 plus the square of the difference in sample 2 of gene 1 and gene 2. Lastly, we have the difference in sample 3 between genes 1 and genes 2. And if you have more samples, the equation just keeps going on and on and on off the page. But you get the idea. To see the Euclidean distance in action, let's assume there are only two samples and two genes. So here we've restricted our data set to two samples and two genes. When there are only two samples and two genes, the formula boils down to the Pythagorean theorem. Just to show everything in action, here are some values that we can use to compute the distance. Now we've plugged those numbers into our formula. On the left side of the equation, we see the values for sample 1, the difference between genes 1 and 2. On the right side, we see the values for sample number 2, the difference between genes 1 and 2. Here we've drawn it out so that you can see how it's related to the Pythagorean theorem. We've put sample 1 on the x-axis and sample 2 on the y-axis. The hypotenuse is the distance between genes 1 and 2. So that's how the Euclidean method works. However, the Euclidean distance is just one method. There are lots more, including the Manhattan method, Canberra, and many others. For example, the Manhattan distance is just the absolute value of the differences, rather than squaring and then taking the square root. And yes, it makes a difference. Bummer. Here's that first heat map I showed. I drew it using the Euclidean distance. Here's what it looks like when we use the Manhattan distance instead. We see that the large clusters remain intact, even though they might be in different orders than they were before. However, with some of the smaller clustering in the finer resolution, we see more differences. However, the choice to use the Euclidean distance or the Manhattan distance is arbitrary. There's no real biological reason why one metric might work better than another. Bummer. Here's some more nitpicky details about how hierarchical clustering works. Do you remember how we merged genes 1 and 3 into cluster number 1 and then compared that cluster to the other genes? Well, there are different ways to do that, too. One simple idea is to compare other genes to the average of the measurements from each sample. But there are lots more. And these different methods affect clustering as well. Bummer. Here we're going to look at different ways to compare clusters. For the sake of visualizing how different methods work, imagine our data was spread out on an XY plane. Now, imagine that we have already formed these two clusters, the green dots and the orange dots. And we just want to figure out which cluster this last point belongs to. We can compare that point to 1, the average, 2, the closest point, 3, the furthest point, and there are many, many other ways to do this. Here are some examples from the second heat map that I showed you. Here what we're doing is we're just swapping out the ways we're comparing clusters. In this first heat map, we're comparing the points to the furthest in the cluster. So we're comparing a gene to a cluster and we're finding the gene that's most different from that one we're comparing it to. This is the default setting in R. Here's what the clustering looks like when we compare points to the cluster average. As you can see, the major blocks of clustered genes and samples have been retained even though they've been reordered. 
However, there are differences in the details. Here's an example where we compare points to the closest point in the cluster. Again, the major features of the clustering have been retained, but are now reordered again. And again, there are differences in the details. In summary, to make a heat map, you first scale the data, either per gene or globally. Second, you cluster the data, either by gene or sample, or both gene and sample. In this stat quest, we focused on hierarchical clustering, and we've seen that within that, we've got to make some decisions. The first is, what's the distance metric going to be? Will it be Euclidean, Manhattan, or something else? And we also have to decide what the clustering method's going to be. Will it be centroid, or average, or look at the furthest point, or the closest point? There are all these different choices that we have to make. The good news is, is most of these choices are set to some default value. If you're doing this in R, just run it and see what you get. If it looks good, go with it. If we don't want to use hierarchical clustering, we can use a method called k-means. When we do this, we have to decide how many clusters there should be in advance. Then the computer figures out which samples go in which cluster by trying to minimize some metric of dispersion, i.e. it's trying to reduce the amount of variance within each cluster. This deserves a separate stat quest. We're not going to talk about it today. So that brings us to the end. Thanks for listening to StatQuest, and look forward to more exciting quests in the land of statistics.